Hi, good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome once again to uh, one of our winter webinars. In fact, our final winter webinar of 2022. Um, and we are really pleased this evening to uh, be once again joined by Janet Hughes, who many of you will know as the uh, programme coordinator for the Future Farming programme. Um, and Janet is going to uh, give us some information uh, and some updates on where we are with um, ELMS and the Future Farm Policy, which many of you will be familiar with and maybe a little bit frustrated by, but we can, uh, we'll can we hopefully hear from Janet why we shouldn't be so frustrated by it now. Um, just a few little bits of admin, as always. Um, just to remind you that the webinar is being recorded um, and it can be uh, watched back again or if you miss anything or want to direct somebody who hasn't been able to join us tonight to it, um, either on the website or on our YouTube channel, which you can subscribe to. And if you search at Tenant Farmers, that will take you directly to our channel. Um, and all of our previous webinar webinars for uh, both this uh, autumn and winter series and also the winter and spring series at the beginning of the year can all be found uh, on, as I say, on both the YouTube channel and the website. So uh, if you miss anything or you want to remind yourself of something, please go back there. Um, secondly, uh, a big thank you to uh, Barclays for once again sponsoring uh, tonight's event. Um, they are big supporters of us at the TFA um, and we're very pleased to have them as our, as our sponsors for this uh, 2022 series of uh, of webinars. Um, this is actually the final uh, webinar that they are sponsoring and they've done this for a, a number of years. Well, it's a number of years ago since we started doing the online stuff with COVID. So really, really uh, big thank you to Barclays for doing that. Um, and just a quick shout out to anybody who wants to sponsor uh, 2022, 2023 series, uh, please get in touch. Uh, we're always welcome to have support from other organisations. Um, so just moving on to uh, this evening, um, as I say, we're lucky enough once again to be joined by Janet Hughes. Um, Janet is heading up the Future Farming and Countryside Programme at DEFRA, um, spends a lot of time, I'm pleased to say, engaging with farmers, uh, trying to find out what we do, and I think it's fair to say uh, it's, it's, it's welcome to us as both stakeholders and as individual farmers that Janet does spend the time uh, to really try and find out what's going on on the ground. Um, we're also joined by Lynette Steele, who many of you will have come across through the TFA. Lynette's our farm policy advisor um, and has been working tirelessly with DEFRA and a whole range of organisations to uh, put our points of view, lobby for what we think is the right way to go in what, to be honest, in most of our lifetime is probably the, uh, the biggest single change in agriculture support that we will have ever seen, um, even going back to uh, IAC single farm payments, whatever they've else have been called, basic payment and so on. Uh, the actual structure of what we're looking at now is significantly different and will be very different going forward. So Lynette does a, a really fantastic job um, and she will be just updating us on where we are as an organisation and the specific things that we are looking to uh, push forward uh, through DEFRA. I thought I might just give a very brief summary of where I think we are and what I think it's important for us as farmers and tenant farmers in particular to be to be looking at. So as you'll know, uh, as I said, Lynette does a lot of uh, uh, lobbying on our behalf. George Dunn, our chief executive, as, as we'll know, does huge amounts of effort at very senior levels throughout government and with other stakeholder bodies. Um, and I'm lucky enough to uh, get involved in some of those stakeholder um, uh, interactions as well. Um, I think it's fair to say though that we are a little bit frustrated as to where we've got to with Elms. There's quite a lot been happening and it felt I think in the middle of the year 
when SFI was launched that that perhaps things were um, about to kick off. Clearly, uh, they did kick off, but not in the way that we thought they might do. And the political upheaval has not been helpful for the last six months. But what it really reminds me of, and I think it is um, something that we all need to do as effectively as, as not just as farmers, but as, as business people, is we really have to make sure that we are running businesses that are able to be sustainable, make a profit uh, and continue into the future and invest in what we want to do on our own farms. Um, possibly we ought to be looking at that without government support. And I don't mean that because we won't get any government support, but I think we all need to be trying to run businesses uh, where the government support is uh, the icing on the cake rather than the way in which we manage to, to remain in business. And I was reminded by a, an ex-colleague of mine in the early 90s when I was working as a consultant in Cambridge um, that we actually had exactly those same discussions in the early 90s about really we need to run sustainable, uh, economically sustainable businesses. And then if we're drawing down government support, then that's a good thing on top of what we're already doing rather than the thing that allows us to remain in business. And I think just at the moment, that's particularly important, particularly of the direction of, of travel. Um, and one thing that DEFRA have got off the ground and is, I believe, running pretty well is the Farming Resilience Fund. Uh, I've, I've noticed another email today, I think from uh, Anderson's, I received an email from saying they were part of that programme as well. And perhaps we should all be encouraged to uh, take advantage of that. It's free advice. It allows people to have a look at where their businesses might go in the future with or without government support, whether that support actually fits your farming business. So um, perhaps we should be encouraged to look at that, but certainly uh, to be looking at our own businesses as can we, can we make sure that we are economically sustainable. And if that means we need to start collaborating and having a perhaps a wider and earlier discussion with our landlords, then uh, I would encourage people to be to be doing that as well. Um, so that's a, that, that's my uh, I'll get off my soapbox now and um, I'll pass over initially to uh, to Lynette, who's going to give us a, an overview, as I say, as a TFA perspective, what we've been doing and hopefully how we feel that our engagement with DEFRA and others has been going. So uh, welcome to Lynette. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. And um, it's um, it's time I get on my soapbox now, I suppose. Um, well, where are we? Gosh, um, I'd really hope when we plan this webinar that I could have given you all a evening with a comprehensive policy update. Um, unfortunately, I, I can't. <laughs> um, let's be honest, it's very frustrating that six years since um, the Brexit vote, four years since Health and Harmony paper, and now into our second year of BPS reductions, that we're not much further forward with the comprehensive domestic agricultural policy we were promised by now. I could go on here about that disappointment, I absolutely could, um, but actually I'm gonna use this time a bit more wisely to update you on the work we at the TFA are doing to advocate for the tenanted farming sector. Now there are three specific actions the TFA believe we need to take forward as a matter of urgency. The first one of those is the speeding up of the rollout of the sustaining sustainable farming incentive, um, bringing forward all the standards at all levels, accompanied by the appropriate payment rates rather than sticking to the old income foregone plus costs approach. Secondly, we would like to see the countryside stewardship model used as the basis um, upon which the objectives of local nature recovery is delivered rather than attempting to um, create a new scheme just for the sake of doing so. And finally, pulling public funding from landscape recovery and focusing it more into SFI, allowing private funding to support those landscape recovery projects. 
Furthermore, there is also a great need to press ahead with a degree of urgency on matters relating to productivity and growth within the agricultural sector. And um, we believe now is the right time to do that. This will require a fundamental review of the way in which support for productivity is given, moving from a list um, basis to a plan led approach. This is an area we at the TFA um, have continued to develop throughout the four years since Health and Harmony paper. Um, and our latest policy paper that we um, created in October and published um, has been sent to the Secretary of State at the start of her term in office to review. We really do believe that embedding farm planning and benchmarking um, with a productivity focus funded through grants, uh, loans and grant guarantees is the right approach to help boost um, rural, the rural economy and at such a vital time at the moment as well. So more importantly, though, apart from all of that, um, there are a few um, issues, two principal issues that need to be addressed in terms of access to schemes for tenant farmers. The first of this is exclusion. Many tenant farmers, as we all know and has been well discussed, have tenancy agreements which are too short. And in comparison to the potential commitments that farmers will be asked um, for through these new schemes, um, where th that's going to be problematic. And in many cases, tenancy clauses are too restrictive also. Let's take a look at the Rules of Good Husbandry, written in uh, 1947, and the definition of agriculture as it applies to agricultural ten tenancies are not beneficial to the, the, the delivery of these environmental targets. Tree planting, for example, um, is out of the scope of the majority of tenant farmers. Secondly, is dislocation. Um, quite a few members are already experiencing the loss of land because their landlords wish to place themselves in pole position um, for whatever public or private schemes come along particularly with regards to tree planting, rewilding and landscape recovery schemes. The government have signalled the need to retain land in the tenanted sector for public goods um, and a way to avoid land leakage must be found. Landlords should not be rewarded um, with public money if they resume land from tenants merely to take part in those schemes themselves. Fortunately, Resolutions to both of these issues form part of the recommendations from the ROC report. It is an absolute must that those recommendations of the report are fully accepted and implemented by government, landlord, land agents and tenant farmers. I know Janet and her team um, have been very impressed with the report and hold it in high regard. And I hope that when we start to see some um, movements soon, um, that those recommendations will be brought forward into the schemes in the new year. Meanwhile, um, we at the TFA continue to meet with all the secretaries of states and ministers as they've come through the doors. Um, and we hope that now the ship has been steadied, the policy decisions will start to be made with haste. Uh, we continue to work with DEFRA colleagues such as Janet and, and her team behind her, um, but also other colleagues in other departments, Natural England, the Environment Agency, Treasury and so on, um, to ensure our members' views and concerns are thoroughly heard and listened to in, in, this, um, in this period. As stakeholders through this, what has been a very long period of co-design, um, it is absolutely our job to hold DEFRA to account and I really hope this evening Janet will be able to at least reassure everyone that all that work is about to come to fruition. Thank you. Thanks Lynette. I think you've I think you've summed up very well in a, in a very short uh, five five minutes or so uh, what has happened and where we are as an organisation and that's and that's really helpful. Um, I think I think it's fair to say that uh, access to schemes is a really 
I'm not I'm not saying it's top of our priority, but it's right up there with we, we seem to have got a lot of top priorities, but that's definitely one of them. Um, and we were uh, George and I were meeting with the Crown this afternoon and I, and I did make the point that the very easy solution of getting access to schemes was just to have longer tenancies so that people could just cover the access. So um, that's something that we do need. But the recommendations from the Rock report, I think, are really critical in that in that regard. Um, so. Uh, on to uh, Janet, if I can just ask Janet to just going to give us 20 minutes or so on where we are now, what we've got to look forward to, um, and how indeed we can access all of these schemes. So over to Janet, if she's, I'm confused by my screen here. I am here, don't worry. There you are. Oh, thank God. I was a bit worried there for a moment. <laughs> I just, did, just decided to just I thought we maybe. I thought we'd maybe put you off between us, me and Lale. I thought you'd maybe no. done a runner. No. Anyway, no. no. Welcome, Janet. Thank you very thank much you. for joining us once again. We always really appreciate you taking the time out to uh, to come and speak to us. So uh, over to you. Thank you. And I always really, really appreciate the opportunity. So thank you very much for setting this up. And thanks everyone for dialing in. And I, I never shy away from, I, I like to think I never shy away from um, questions or scrutiny or criticism. And that's part, that's a really important part of my job. That's how we learn what's working and what isn't and how we can make it better. So yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, I think the first thing- Sorry, Janet, I'm just going to butt in very quickly and yeah? just say, because I've failed miserably on one of my admin tasks, which oh, is, go on. Uh, we've got a series of uh, Q&A questions that have been sent in prior to the event. But please, just to remind everybody, and I'm sure you will have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. Uh, and between us, we will, uh, we, will, we will try and pick them up uh, after Janet's spoken. So apologies, Janet, for cutting no you problem. off there. But it's important that people know that. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, so the first thing to say is that the context that you're all operating in is extremely, extremely challenging on multiple fronts. And I just want to, first of all, say that I I recognize that and I understand it and I think obviously you've got the um, economic situation price volatility um, and all of those aspects you've got the fact that we're doing as Mark says the biggest changes that have been made to farming policy in decades and also we've had as Mark mentioned the period where we've had um, three secretaries of state in DEFRA over as many months um, and there's been we haven't been able to be as clear and as um, comprehensive as we might have liked to be about what's coming next in the policy and we really do recognise that and ministers very much recognise that and also it's really important to say up front that your job as farmers is to do the farming that you do and we absolutely respect that and value it and want to work alongside that and get behind you to do the things that you're already doing to grow food and other produce but also to take care of the natural environment which only farmers can do since farming covers 70% of the land in England and the land is where a lot of the action needs to happen to keep us on track towards the really important targets that we've got not just for food production but also for climate and environment outcomes so you are absolutely critical and if what we're doing doesn't work for you then it doesn't work at all so that's why as Mark says I spend a lot of time talking to farmers and listening to what you've got to say and answering your questions and visiting to see what's going on so that we can and my team do too so we can understand how is this actually going to land and how's it going to work on the ground and a vitally important part of that is how is this going to work for tenant farmers who as has already been said cover huge areas of the ground do a lot of the producing that we want to do and currently don't have decent access to the sorts of schemes that we're offering in terms of the um, environmental land management so what are we doing about that so we are as we were before doing three sets of things the first and in some ways most important is we're sorting out the way we serve you in our services and that includes the things we do to set and enforce the rules of farming and the regulatory requirements and legal standards but also the way we deliver services and there have been improvements in recent years in terms of things like basic things like making payments on time um, but we know we've got a lot more to do to make sure that you can see us as people who understand what you're trying to do are trying to help you succeed operate fairly transparently effectively responsively that you can get your business done you don't have to pay somebody else to fill in a form just because we made it so complicated you can get a prompt reply and you can get the money when you're expecting it and all those sorts of things and we know that we haven't got there yet and we've got to sort those things out because if we don't we can't possibly expect you to engage in the things that we want you to engage in so we've done a lot of that already we can get into that this evening in the q a if you'd like some of the sorts of things we've done there are we've reformed our approach to to inspections which we now call site visits both in terms of cross compliance and also in schemes to make that whole setup much more proportionate and fair as well as being effective where it needs to be we've improved some of our service offering to make it more simple and straightforward so if you apply for sfi if you haven't had a look at that yet 
you'll see online that we've made that process much more straightforward than it's been before. It ought to be possible for you to do it yourself for your farm. And when you apply to join SFI, you'll hear from us usually within two weeks, often much more quickly. You can start your agreement the following month and you'll get paid three months after that. That's a very different kettle of fish to where we've been before with countryside stewardship. And now that we've made those improvements in SFI, we're now going to apply those across all of our schemes so we can make them all simpler, clearer, faster and fairer. So that's the first set of things we're doing to transform our services to you so that you can rely on us and that we can show you the appropriate respect and fairness that you quite rightly should expect. The second thing we're doing is reforming our approach to environmental land management schemes, as you know, and as has been mentioned, and we still are rolling out three schemes. We still are rolling out sustainable farming incentive. That's open for applications now, but it's quite a limited offer um, at the moment because that was the first year of operation and we can only introduce things as we reduce payments through BPS. And as more money comes out of that, we can then put it into schemes. But next year we'll be adding a lot more into that scheme. And the thing for tenants to note, thanks to Tenant Farmers Association in particular, is that we worked very closely with George and, and Lynette and Mark on making sure that SFI is accessible to tenants. So unlike countryside stewardship, where you enter into a five-year agreement, which is, excludes anyone with a tenancy shorter than that, in SFI, the agreements are three years long. If you only have two years left on your tenancy, that's fine. You can come in and leave after two years. If, you're, if you have less than, if you're, if you're a rolling sort of arrangement, whether it's an annual license or a one-year rolling FBT, but you expect to continue to have management control for three years, you can also come into SFI and just leave with no penalty and no consequences if you lose management control of the land during that time. You don't need landlord consent to join the scheme either. So those are some things that we've put in place for SFI for this year. And what we're going to be doing over the next year is bringing much more scope into SFI so that things that have previously not been accessible to you will be. So options that you might have been interested in in countryside stewardship before but haven't been available to you, you will now be able to access through SFI next year. Uh, we know you need to see the details of that in terms of what exactly is coming and how much we're going to pay and what exactly you're required to do and what exactly are the rules. That is coming now very shortly and uh, ministers are fully, fully aware of the urgency of providing that information. I've just spent an hour and a half with the Secretary of State this afternoon and the following minister talking through some of this and they are very much cracking through decisions with a view to getting that information out as soon as they possibly can about what we're going to pay for next year through the sustainable farming incentive and I hope when you see that that the feedback that Lynette was just giving about bringing more scope forward making it accessible looking at how we set the prices um, and making sure that what you're getting is a fair reward for what we're asking you to do and it's clear and it's workable on farm I hope you'll see when we publish that information that we have taken a lot of that feedback on board um, and in particular that we want to make sure the scheme is going to work for you and there's a decent range of things for you to get paid for. Now, obviously you can believe that when you see it, but it is coming very soon. And I'm day by day more and more confident we'll get that out very soon because ministers are giving a lot of time to this and a lot of energy to it with a view to getting it out there. So that's the first environmental land management scheme. The second one is what we used to call local nature recovery. And the purpose of, so sustainable farming incentive is for actions that can be done really by any farmer anywhere. And we want that scheme to be straightforward to access, really easy to interact with and attractive to lots of farmers. We want to get most farmers into that scheme over time by 2028. Local nature recovery, as we've been referring to it so far, is about more targeted specific types of action. So if you've got some existing habitat on your farm, if you've got some woodland, if you've got a watercourse, if you've got some particular special habitat like salt marshes or peatland or whatever, then um, that scheme is for you. And, and you can combine these two schemes on the same area of land. And we, we were going to roll that out as a separate individual scheme. What we've decided to do instead, what we've discovered is that's creating a lot of uncertainty and worry in the sector about how that scheme is going to work and who's going to have access to it and is, it, is the money going to go to farmers or not. What we've decided to do instead is evolve countryside stewardship. And when we say evolve countryside stewardship, what we mean is deliver some additional, offer some extra options through that scheme to cover a wider range of actions improve the service, make it much more accessible to tenants, small farmers, upland farmers, lowland grazing livestock farmers, all of those who might currently feel like the offer isn't comprehensive or sufficient for them. Um, and also look at rewarding and incentivizing people to join up across local areas, people doing the right things in the right places and people delivering outstanding results. And the Rock Review, as has been mentioned, made some really helpful constructive recommendations about how we can go about making the, those actions accessible to tenant farmers as well as the ones in SFI. So we've got the flexibility in the sustainable farming incentive scheme, 
we're going to put much more scope into that scheme so you can access it and then there are the things that we're going to do through countryside stewardship now that was previously known as local nature recovery um, which we are also looking at how we can make sure that you can have access and some of the suggestions there are things like can, could you come into an agreement that's longer than your tenancy and be able to transfer that agreement to somebody else after the end of your tenancy and for that to be something that can be done smoothly and that's one of the that's one of the recommendations another is could you come into an agreement jointly with a landlord so that a landlord takes responsibility for making sure the scheme is seen all the way through to the end even if you aren't you don't have an fbt that covers that period of time so i'm not promising i'm going to do either of those things i'm just trying to give you a flavor of the sorts of things we're looking at to make sure that that scheme is also really accessible to tenants so we've heard the feedback from tenant farmers who said to us why are you creating this new scheme that's really complicated and really confusing everybody why don't you evolve what you've got already instead it's not perfect I and mean, we don't think it's perfect at all but it exists it's a known quantity and we can build from there and so that's what we're now going to do and then the third environmental management scheme is a landscape recovery where we've we, that's a bespoke set of projects for people who want to do collaborate over a larger area over a longer period of time we have had the first round of competition for those projects and we awarded 22, um, 22 lots of funding to projects that are doing landscape recovery projects and of those half of them included tenants as active participants in that piece of work. So we're really pleased to see that, that almost all of them involve groups of farmers working together um, and collaborating across a wider area, producing food as well as taking care of the environment and half of them involve tenants actively participating. So that scheme is not perfect yet. It was just the first round of it, but we're really pleased to see that I don't want there to be a myth that the only thing tenants can do is SFI and everything else isn't accessible to you because it is. It just depends what sort of things you want to do over what scale and over what time period really. So you've got those three schemes. We've opened the Sustainable Farming Incentive for Applications this year. We'll be expanding it significantly next year. We'll publish information about that very shortly. We've got Countryside Stewardship, which exists now. It will be running for another round as it currently exists next year. So if you're not in it already, you'll be able to apply next year. And then we'll be adding in more scope, making it more flexible and accessible, and adding in those ways of targeting. And then we've got landscape recovery. So we've got improving our services. We've got the three environmental and environmental land management schemes and then we've got our one-off payments we've got a range of different grants that we offer to support animal health and welfare productivity innovation and environmental type improvements and also access um, and heritage and what we currently do with those is offer them through a range of different processes and timescales what we're seeking to do is harmonize those so you can go online and see all the things that are going to be available and we're also looking to publish a much better look ahead so you can see what's coming and you can plan ahead for the grants that you want to access instead of just having to be lucky when the window happens to open that that's a, that's something that you want to do right then so that will also be coming in the new year much more information about what you can expect on that front and that again is thanks to feedback from colleagues here who have been saying to us we need more time to plan we need to know what's coming so we will be doing that in the new year those are the three things we're doing i've mentioned the rock review i do just want to pay tribute to george who was part of that and the other members of that group where Baroness Kate Rock led a review, very rapid review, but also very in depth of what is, what is the full range of issues that are getting in the way of a really positive path forward for tenant farmers and their relationship with their landlords. And some of those are way outside my remit and things that ministers are considering about how tenancy law. I think Janet may have just hung, has she, or is that me? Hopefully we'll get Janet back shortly. Well, well, hopefully Janet can uh, see us and we'll leave Julia to try and pick that up because she's much better at any of this kind of um, technical organisation than, than, than I am. Um, I see there's already a few questions coming through on, on the Q&A and hopefully shortly uh, when, when we get Janet back, we can uh, pick up on a few of those. Oh, yeah, I think she must be rejoining. Um, I think one thing that perhaps uh, is interesting just to pick up on my comment earlier about, about making sure we're resilient is it was a very interesting um, to attend. Well, I was a panelist, asked to be a panelist at the Nat Natural England Conference in Birmingham last week. And there were three excellent um, farms, uh, one from Uplands in Cumbria, uh, one from East Anglia and one from down near head off in Thiel, actually, at Yattenden Estate. Um, and what really struck me about all of them is they have very much embraced the sort of environmental conservationist approach to how they run their farming businesses. Um, but they'd all very much done this initially kind of, I, well, I wouldn't say off their own backs and without any incentive because they were clearly part of 
countryside stewardship or, or one or two of the other schemes that were around. But they very much had, were, had, had chosen to plan a path of their how their business was going to run without that uh, with, w- and hadn't built their business around getting those kind of support, but obviously were able to do that. And maybe that's uh, something was a good lesson. I think Janet's back with us, are you? I'm, yeah, I'm so sorry. I don't know what's happened. No I've lost my, clearly lost my connection. Where was I up to when I when you lost me? And I'll pick up where I left off. Thank you. <laughs> you've that's you've just mentioned, you'd, you'd meant, no, I was listening. You've, you've <laughs> just mentioned that you've had, you've got the three schemes. You've, you've got CS Plus, you've got SFI, um, and you've got LR, and you've got an improved, uh, I'll call it admin, but I think you mean kind of engagement yeah. and how things get processed. So you were sort of summarising at that point, I think is where you'd reached. Fine. So we've got the improving the service, we've got the three schemes that I've talked through, and we've got, I was going on to say, we've got a range of one-off grants that will give you support if you want to invest in animal health and welfare, productivity, innovation, research and development, then those grants will be for you. And what we're trying to do there is make it much clearer what's available when, give you a bit more of a forward view of what's coming so you can plan ahead instead of just being lucky when the window happens to open um, so that you can, you can rely on, right, that window's going to open at that point. I want to grant on that thing. I can get ready for it ahead of time. And you don't need to pay someone to tell you what grants are available or navigate the excitement of gov.uk to find them so there's there's a service there's the schemes there's the grants and then i just did you did i did you hear me talk about the rock review and pay tribute to that fantastic piece of work and how you just you just started uh, praising george for being such a excellent participant on that committee. he is an excellent well he's an excellent critical friend in general but that <laughs> particular group has been really really thoughtful serious piece of work very constructive it covers a lot of things which aren't in my remit about tenancy law tax law and how that works and the wider context in which tenants operate all of which is very important but it also includes lots of practical recommendations about things we can do within our schemes to make them more accessible to tenants and we are looking at that very seriously and we'll be publishing a report in due course um, but when i say due course that's not civil sermon for at some point never that means very shortly by the way just to be clear um, i don't want to give the impression that we're not we're not on that with some haste we are and ministers are as well and um, the final couple of things I wanted to say are, Mark mentioned the Resilience Fund. What that is, is we are funding a range of organisations to provide free expert business planning advice to farmers. So if you haven't yet taken advantage of that, please do. We get good feedback about it in general. You can choose which organisation that you want to give you the advice and they'll come to you and give you specific individual advice to help you think about how do you, how is your, what's your business going forward? What are your options? What are the sorts of things that you might do as BPS is phased out and these schemes rolled out? And um, so Resilience Fund is what that's called. If you Google it, you'll find the information. Um, and then we want to make sure that what we're doing here is going to work for all types of farms. So we're particularly focused on tenants in this conversation, but we're also very mindful of the need to make sure what we're doing is going to work for upland farmers, small farmers, lowland grazing livestock farmers, and of course, arable and horticultural farmers and others who are doing the, all, all the whole range of farm types and settings and tenancies and locations. And the sort of engagement that we have formally it's with organisations like TFA, but also in our informal one-to-one engagement with lots and lots of farms. We've got more than 5,000 farmers working with us. Really helps inform that. And if you're not already engaged in that and you'd like to be, then do please get in touch and I'll be very happy to let you know how or we can pick that up in the Q&A. Um, and then... Last thing to say is just the, the issues that um, that Lynette mentioned about length of contract, restrictive clauses, but also I think access to capital and the kind of limitations on the types of options you have available to your business are all things that Tenant Farmers Association have been talking to us about for some time. So we didn't wait for the rock review to find these things out. We have been working with colleagues here. And, then, and you will see, I think, in the information that we're going to publish very shortly, I think, good evidence that 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 engagement has borne fruit as Lynette said so the things we're going to publish shortly as I said are information about what we're going to pay for in the sustainable farming incentive in 2023 but also some information about everything else we're going to pay for in our schemes so you can see the full picture and you can plan ahead and you can see if you're in a scheme already what else is that you can get paid for and if you're not in a scheme at all yet what's the range of stuff that's going to be on offer and when's it coming that will also come very shortly and also just to note we have heard the feedback about prices um, and um, what Minister Spencer, our new farming minister, said in the um, Parliament when I was with him there, giving evidence to the select committee, is we have heard that feedback loud and clear. Um, I can't say anything right now about that, but we are, ministers have heard it, and we have heard it, and we have been looking at that issue. And so you can expect further communications around that as well in, in the not very distant future.
So I hope that's a helpful overview of where we are. I'm really happy to get into questions and answers. And if you don't get at time to um, get a chance to ask your question this evening, or you're not happy with the answer and you want more information or anything like that, then I'm really easy to find on the internet. I'm act very active on Twitter. If that's your thing, just look for me. Look, look me up. I'm Janet Hughes um, on Twitter. That's my handle. Um, or if you want to email me, I'm janet.hughes at defra.gov.uk and you can email me and I will make sure you get the information that you're looking for. So please don't, if you don't want to um, put your hand up here or you don't get a chance, then please do follow up after and I'll be happy to help. Back to you, Mark. Thank you. Hope that's helpful. Brilliant, Janet. Thank, thank you very much for that as ever. Um, just on, on the questions, obviously, we've, we've got a few that have been sent through. There's some coming through on the Q&A, which is great. Just to reassure everybody, if we don't get around to your question, uh, we will ask slash enforce Janet to answer them yeah. uh, and put the question, put the answers back on, on our website. So uh, if we don't get around to them, and I'm fairly sure we won't because we've never managed yet to answer all the questions on one of these webinars, uh, rest assured you will, you will get an answer to it. Um, Janet, that's, that's really useful. I, I guess I will just pick up, and, and you know this from from the interactions we've had over the last few weeks, but I'll pick up on some of the points that Lynette made as well, in that it, it is good to hear this. It's good to hear that we are gonna continue with countryside stewardship and you make that more ambitious. That's something, as you know, we've been pressing for for quite some time. Um, so there is some positivity, but we are now at a stage where people are looking at, you know, they've had 20% of their BPS taken now, uh, they, which they've just received, so it's it's in sharp focus. And really, we do need these things to come forward absolutely like yesterday, because people need to be able to apply for these schemes, not least because I think there's a genuine concern that if we're unable to do that, uh, we may end up in 2024, uh, when at the end of this parliament, when the money hasn't been uh, hasn't been taken by by farmers, not because we don't want to apply for it but because he simply haven't been able to access it and treasury may well say well i told you farmers don't really need this money and that 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 simply isn't the case and we don't want to let that happen so uh we really do want to you know keep this moving and and, and press on i'm just going to start very quickly with a question sorry I, and, and also I invite lynette to join us again i think you have she's still with us aren't you lynette oh hey you are um because you can chip in to answer the questions as well, please, uh, as and when you feel fit. Um, I'm just going to kick off with with one thing, though. Uh, well, sort of two questions in one. As I say, are we really welcome that countryside stewardship is going to be kind of retained, if you like? Um, can I can I just ask? First of all, you've made some good steps with SFI to enable tenants on, particularly on shorter term term tenancies, to be able to access it. However, as Countryside stewardship stands at the moment, it's a five year scheme and tenants won't be able to access that if they don't have management control for long enough. So how will you address that? Secondly, with CS, are you envisaging that a number of options will just simply move seamlessly in the early part of January into SFI? Um, and how does that affect people on current CS schemes and their own SFI applications? Um, and thirdly, are you expecting a CS plus to pretty much reflect what you wanted LNR to do in the fullness of time? Sorry, a few questions yeah. there. No, that's good. And, and I completely hear what you say about speed being of the essence. And literally nobody here is under any illusion about that. We know this is absolutely urgent. And I'm talking about officials and ministers who, are, who very much understand we have got to publish this information about what we're going to pay for, how much, and how it's going to work for tenants and other, other types of farmer. So we during this period where we haven't, where we've had this change in political leadership, we have absolutely not been sitting on our hands. We've been progressing the work, we've been engaging with ministers throughout, we've been getting ready to publish the information. We are not far off being able to do that now. We will do it very shortly. And that is my absolute 100% focus is getting that done. So we're not under any illusion about that at all. In terms of CS and the uh, countryside stewardship and what we mean when we say we're going to evolve that. So really, there's three things 
that we want to have that we don't currently have that that we would have delivered through local nature recovery and we're now going to deliver through countryside stewardship and there's no change in the destination at all in the sense of where we're trying to get to and the three things are pay for a wider range of things so that we can contribute to all of the outcomes that we want to see we can cover all the different types of farm we can make sure there's a comprehensive offer that works in lot, all the different types of farms and locations etc so that's basically adding more scope into the scheme and we'll publish more information about that very shortly about what that extra scope is and it will all come in by 20, by the end by 2024 that will all be there we'll putting some of it forward in 2023 so that's the first thing. The second thing is um, improving the service. So where we've, with SFI, automated a lot of the process so we can do it much more quickly. Currently in the countryside stewardship, it takes us six or seven months to process all of the applications. You start, you, you apply by July, you start your agreement in January, you don't get paid till the following December. That means you've got to bankroll all the work in that first year, which is obviously really difficult to do, and particularly with cash flow pressures as they are. So what we're doing, what we're going to do is apply the improvements that we made in our SFI service to countryside stewardship so that over the next year or two we'll move to a position where we want to have a rolling window so there's no fixed window you can apply whenever you want and start whenever you want we process applications much more quickly than we do now and we make payments quarterly so that you don't have to bankroll all the activity for a whole year and get paid at the end of that year you'll get paid every quarter so from three months after you start um, and that's one of the aspects of it the other is sorting out the improve the um, controls so that they're fair and proportionate and you feel like you're not taking a massive risk of penalties and things like that within the scheme for for no useful reason which has happened in the past um, and there are various other aspects of service improvement so that you've got the scope you've got service improvement and then the third thing is we want to be able to encourage and reward people doing the right actions in the right places where they can really make an impact we want to support people to join up across local areas where you're still in an individual agreement but if you're all doing things which join up in some way like they're taking care of a catchment or looking after habitats that join up with each other then there are then there's extra incentives to do that and then the final thing is for those who um knock it out of the park and go way beyond what was required and deliver excellent results. So you've got the scope, you've got the service and you've got the targeting. All those things are what we're now going to do through CS. What we're going to do in terms of the length of tenancies and making it accessible to tenants is some of what's currently in countryside stewardship will be delivered using the rules that we've now set for SFI. And that will be all the things which are in countryside stewardship, which are the type of actions that can be taken anywhere by anybody to benefit. So lots of the, some of the sort of winter cover, margins, um, wildflower strips, water body buffering, all sorts of things like that, which you can do whenever, wherever you are, it's a good idea to do those things. All of those will be offered through the SFI rules by 2024, which means that you'll have a three year agreement and the sorts of flexibilities I mentioned earlier. So a lot of what's in CS will, through that process, become much more accessible to you as tenants is the idea. And then what remains in countryside stewardship will be more, the more targeted um, specific types of activities and what we're doing there is looking at how we can make those also really accessible to tenants. Some of those, the nature of them means that you want longer agreements but we don't want that to result in tenants being excluded from them and that's why we're talking about things like could you transfer agreements, could you have joint agreements with landlords, how can we make it so that you've got full access to that full range of activities. So it won't stay as it is as just it's a five-year scheme tough if you if you if you don't have a fpt that long you can't come in it won't stay like that it will it will evolve very rapidly into something much more accessible and then the final thing is that um, if we're moving as you asked about um, moving some options so they're delivered through sfi really so what we're trying to do is provide we're, we're trying to avoid any sort of cliff edge or any sort of complete nightmare where people have to transfer from one scheme to another scheme and it's all very bureaucratic and difficult so the idea is that we, this is a sort of evolutionary process that is smooth and straightforward there's no cliff edge if you're in a cs agreement now there'll be a smooth way for you to carry on doing what you're doing and add more things in one of the things we're going to do is allow you to add in things to your agreement year on year instead of waiting until the end of your agreement to do that so if you're not in a scheme at all, you can decide, do you want to go into CS next year? If you do, you can also add on things that are in SFI alongside that, as long as you're not paying for the same things twice. And um, if you're already in CS, that's fine. You can carry on in CS and you can add SFI things onto the side um, and add the new scope that's coming onto the side. Um, and in all cases, the whole thing, by, this is a temporary complexity of having the two running alongside each other in this way because of the nature of the way we're rolling the schemes out. By the time it gets to 2024, there'll be a clear offer which is just the offer and we'll be then smoothly transitioning people into that so that everybody has access to all the improvements we're making 
all of the extra scope we're providing and all the extra sorts of incentives that we're talking about. And we can, moving to evolving countryside stewardship instead of building a whole new local nature recovery scheme really helps us do that. So we don't have to have a sort of, everybody worrying about what happens at the end of their agreement. If you're being paid for something now in CS, you can broadly expect those options to carry on. Um, but we'll, we'll be improving them all, making them more flexible, making them more workable, and we'll be improving the rules of the scheme. But it hopefully just gives you all a lot more clarity and certainty and stability instead of worrying about, gosh, I've only got three years left. I don't know what's coming after that, which we know people have been worrying about. So hopefully you'll see when we publish that information, a much clearer path forward and much more clarity as to how you can engage with the schemes and how they're going to work for you. And Janet, sorry, just to jump in there, Mark. Um, yeah. One thing we have talked about, Janet and myself, and Mark, just so everybody knows, with regards to service improvement, and it's quite pointed because Emma Bradley's asked a question in the Q&A about exiting a scheme when it's a force majeure situation that yeah. has been taken back off you um we're hoping to clarify that aren't we janet in when you won't receive a penalty because it's not yeah. your fault because that is something that we really know is important to our members and at the moment in sfi it's reviewed on a case-by-case -case, yeah. um, basis which terrifies me to tell you the truth so um uh, yeah that's something that's really key yeah. service improvement as well isn't it yeah and the terrifying you thing is a really important point because we're trying to what we're trying to do is in the schemes is respond to the feedback that we've had that the rules of the schemes are much too prescriptive and restrictive and we want more flexibility and we want more pragmatism and so for, in SFI what we've said is if for some reason you can't deliver what you're supposed to deliver let us know and we'll have a conversation about it and we'll be fair and it, by the way there are no penalties in SFI we don't have the power to give penalties under S, in SFI so the worst that would happen if you just can't do something is we stop paying you for it and if you haven't done it at all and you haven't responded to any sort of conversation to try and get it done we might ask you to pay back the money we've paid you for that action but only if it was a serious breach and you've had multiple times to fix it or there was some obvious willful negligence so we, we've tried to really constrain we don't have penalties we've said we're going to take a much more proportionate approach if we find something that's not right and it's obviously been like it's just not worked out then you get a chance to remedy it we don't suddenly start getting money back off you and getting penalties etc and then in the kind of event where you've got a force majeure you lose management control or whatever we've said if you've got a good reason then that's fine we haven't written down what all the good reasons are because we're trying not to be prescriptive but in a context where historically we've done a lot of um penalties for things that don't matter and it's been seen as very punitive and unfair when people see that flexibility what they see is risk so these two things go hand in hand. You've got, you, the flexibility only works if you can build trust and confidence in the fact that we are serious about doing controls in a more proportionate and fair way. And we've, we've, we've made those changes. They're starting to play through. We are getting some positive feedback about it, but we know that's going to take time to win everybody's confidence. And those two things have got to go hand in hand. Otherwise, people see flexibility and feel terrified. They're going to fall foul of some secret rule that we haven't published, which is not how we're working. But I can say that till I'm blue in the face. It's going to take you seeing it to believe it. And we do really recognise that. Yeah, no, I think that I think that's a really, 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 really important. And, and you'll only see the benefit of that when it actually happens on the ground and people can have uh, evidence that that's happened. Um, yeah. I'm just, I'm just going to move on slightly. We've got a, a question here from a, a member down in Devon, and, and I think we've heard this a lot from both our members and perhaps across the industry a bit. Uh, it says that the uh, work on addressing the key issues for uplands and the commons seems to have stalled. The SFI Moreland standard is not fit for purpose. What can we expect to, sorry, when can we expect to see some more concrete standards that will include access to the scheme for these vitally important landscapes? BPS is a lifeline for a lot of farmers on the commons and moorland, and it feels like the moment that they've been put into a too difficult box. I think that is really relevant. And, and whilst we can welcome the, the, the countryside stewardship sort of containing that, it has also been a criticism of countryside stewardship that the uplands have been left, uh, well, I was going to say high and dry, that's probably not a very good use of the, of the term, but they've left without significant options. So it'd be really good to hear, Janet, where, where you think all this fits in, because I think this is really key to a lot of our members. Yeah, it really is. So I'll do I'll do uplands and commons separately because although they often overlap, they are there are also separate issues. So in relation to uplands, I'm going to interpret that to mean both moorland farming, but also anybody on a hill, because I think in both of those cases, 
there are more options that you want to offer that people can get paid for. There's more we need to do to sort ourselves out in terms of the relationship between things like triple SIs, stocking levels, schemes, access to schemes, tenancy, small farms, etc. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of complex issues that come inspire to mean that you can't get the best out of the schemes if you're in one of those particular situations and we know that so the answer to this is first of all we've got some extra things that we want to pay for and we've been reviewing oh no have you frozen again no you're okay um, no, we've you're been fine. reviewing like what of the things we want to pay for which ones are relevant to the uplands are we rolling those out in a timely way so that there is a there is a increasing offer for those in uplands settings but also we've been looking at the related issues to do with tenancy to do with how we how we deal with permanent pasture and grassland and what the options are there and there's also options to do with animal health and welfare that are going to be relevant so it definitely hasn't stalled it certainly is not in the too difficult to do box because it's absolutely critical the uplands are really critical for the reasons that you've said and, and we've got to make sure that what we're doing is going to work for upland farmers because a one of our one of our objectives is about maintaining food production and maintaining the profitability and productivity and improving the productivity to the sector but also upland farmers play a huge role in taking care of that landscape and in those local communities as well so it's, it's very important and in fact as it, as it happens i'm going to visit some upland farmers this friday and i've been to been to see quite a few to understand the issues there and they are particular issues i know so it definitely hasn't stalled it's definitely not in the too difficult box commons are difficult they, they're not in the too difficult box, but they are complicated and difficult. And um, one of the re one of the things about evolving countryside stewardship rather than starting from scratch with local nature recovery is that there's been a lot of work over years trying to make sure that countryside stewardship works for commons. It's not perfect. We know there's more to do. What we want is to create an environment similar to what we want to do with landlords and tenants, although the issues are separate, I know, but we want to create an environment in which there is a positive opportunity for everybody involved in a common to get what they need from the schemes, thrive, run their businesses, operate in a positive, collaborative way. And we know that that doesn't always happen. And we have been working closely with Commons experts and stakeholders. It's true that over the last two or three months, as we've been discussing, there's been, there's been some other things that we've been having to pay attention to, which have meant that we haven't communicated a lot about what's happening on these. But as part of all the communications that are coming, now that we're able to turn that tap back on again, some of the stuff we've got to say will be about these issues and we'll be very keen to keep on with that engagement. We have got work going on. So the Uplands Alliance um, and others are doing some work to trial. What do, the, what do the other levels of ambition look like for the Moreland Standard and Sustainable Farming Incentive? And that's going really well. Um, we've got various we've got various strands of work looking at how we're going to make sure that common those on commons can access the scheme. And one of the things there is that when I'm talking about flexibility and adding things in year on year, that's much more difficult for commons because it's so, it so involves quite a lot to get the commons to a position where it can actually enter into an agreement. So that's one of the issues there. Um, but we're not, yeah, it's definitely not in the too difficult to do box. We've got a lot of difficult things to do. We don't shy away from those at all. We know we've got to get those sorted. That's what makes this complicated. But when we get it right, that's what will make it rewarding as well for everyone, we hope. Yeah, I know. Thanks again, Jenna. I think, again, just I know we keep bashing on about this, but but time is of the essence here. And, and it's certainly in those areas that I think uh, we've probably tended to see uh, perhaps what we could term as bad behaviour by landlords taking land back in hand in order to access a scheme, partly possibly because there isn't an option for tenants to get involved in those. And therefore, the landlord doesn't see how they're going to generate you know, the continued income. It's a really, really important part of how that whole landscape works, I think. Yeah. And just just, just sort of slightly connected to that, but uh, John Wibberley uh, asks in the, in the Q&As, and, and I, I agree with this wholeheartedly, but I wonder where you sit on this. He says that Elms is a key opportunity for tenants and landlords to, be, to liaise for mutual benefit, as well as generating public good. But this requires proper brokering where does DEFRA sit on that and how you influence that? Uh, and obviously it's a key recommendation of the ROC report as well. Uh, we've all got a, a part to play in this, but where, where do you see this working within your schemes and what influence do you think you can have as, a, as the sort of organisation behind, government organisation behind this to encourage better collaboration? Yeah, so I think there's a few different aspects to this. One is that we should, we want to design out the need for complicated brokering by making the rules really clear and really fair. So, for example, an SFI 
if you're the person if you're the one doing the taking care of the soil which you will be if you're a tenant farmer then you're the one who should get paid through sfi and that's that's in the rules and so you shouldn't need to have to go and negotiate about that that's just part of the scheme rule and that's how it works so there's there's some important things that we can do there and the rock review has pointed to some of the rules that we need to make sure are clear and that are in place to make sure that everybody's on a fair footing everybody's rights are respected and the environment is there for people to have a positive relationship not leaving loads of unhelpful ambiguity or complexity in that relationship i think there's the rock review pointed to wider issues about tenancy law and restrictive clauses and contracts and the definition of agricultural land for tax purposes and all sorts of other issues which are relevant to this because they have a bearing on what you can and can't do as a tenant and what your kind of bargaining position is when you're talking about schemes with your landlord um, and that, that those are all under active consideration by ministers um, and then the, in terms of brokering I know the rock review recommended that there should be a tenancy commissioner ministers are certainly have been have been have read that and are considering it and you can expect them to comment on it in their formal response I think it's, it's fair to say our position to date has been we don't think government should be getting involved in individual contractual disputes and going and brokering relationships between landlords and tenants but we certainly do want to see an environment in which it's more likely there'll be a positive outcome from those sorts of discussions and everybody's incentivized and supported to do those things so we think there is definitely a role for government in the way we set the rules for schemes the way we operate the way we set the schemes up but then there is also an extent to which these are contractual relationships between parties that need to be able to and we, we can't do anything to kind of fetter the rights of those parties but i don't want to preempt any formal response to the rock review and i'm not doing that by saying those things i'm just telling what the position is have been to date on these issues but ministers are actively considering the rock review and as i said it's a serious piece of work worthy of serious consideration and that's what it's getting yeah I mean, I think anything that can be done to encourage collaboration without setting too many rules, because yeah. I think it's important that we as tenants and landlords as landlords can have some influence on how we organise that relationship. But it does feel like the direction of travel with Elms and, and the way we're going is a bit of a once in a lifetime opportunity to make those relationships yeah. really work but there probably needs to be a bit of encouragement to allow them to work in a seamless manner. Yeah. Um, just, Mark, just, sorry, to, just to jump in. Um, we yeah. did also do a paper with the CLA on collaboration as well, um, yes. which yeah. um, sets out some really good premises. And I know DEFRA has, has been looking at that as well yeah. um, to bring that into schemes. Yeah, and that was that. What was particularly helpful about that is it was all about what we're talking about. About let's create this positive environment. Let's make it much more possible and much more likely that those positive collaborations will happen. And when you have CLA and TFA working together on something like that about how it should work, obviously that's very powerful because that's all part. That's they're representing the different parties to that conversation and trying to come at it with a constructive mindset. And that that really helps us in government to think. Well, normally often you have we have to liaise with the different interests and we're trying to balance it internally but where you can organize in that way and say well actually we've had the conversation and this is what we think you should do in the same way that the rock review has done and that joint piece of work did it's really helpful to us so that doesn't mean we always can do absolutely everything that you recommend but we certainly do take it very seriously when you do that um, and, and really recognize the issues as you say yeah just just sticking with the the, the rock report I'm, I'm conscious of time as usual and uh, we aren't going to get all your questions answered i'm afraid so apologies to once we don't but this is one perhaps perhaps lynette you could just pick this one up a little bit um uh is there a risk as the rock Revo rock review recommends recommendations are implemented that the nature of agricultural tendencies both traditional aha and fbts will change and that they'll become more multi-purpose land lettings, whereas the basis at the moment is that landlords let, let land for agricultural purposes and reserve to themselves the non-agricultural elements, so minerals, woodlands, right to develop and whatever. And we're now throwing environmental stuff into that. Is that a concern for us, Lynette, as an organisation? And how does that, how do we kind of want to make that work? Yeah, so certainly we are already seeing some um, tenancy agreements, which are more, although let under agricultural terms, are more focused on maybe stewardship of the land rather than running a profitable agricultural business. Um, we've certainly seen quite a few of those um, from uh, the National Trust more of late. Um, I think we could see that as a threat, but it could also be an opportunity um, that maybe there are the, the, the industry becomes more diverse. Um, actually, these uh, uh, slight change, I'm not for one moment concerned, unless George is going to jump in here and tell me I'm wrong, 
um, to think <laughs> that all agricultural tendencies are going to disappear. Um, but it could encourage growth in the in the industry and introduction introducing innovation as well. Um, certainly more business are having to diversify. Um, and if we can have tenancies which allow that without constrictive clauses, without landlords permission requirements, um, I actually think that that could be could be a really good opportunity. Um, but maybe that's <laughs> that's just my view. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you're. I think you're right. I think we've got to look for where the opportunities are, and I think that's 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 very true. And I, I don't. I think we should be aware of aware of the issues that may arise. But I think that's that's right. W one issue that does raise Janet is regards to the definition of agriculture, which we've sort of discussed, and and where environmental schemes might fit into that, because currently. I suspect they don't in lots of cases. Is that something that the ministers are aware of? And, yeah. and how are you wanting to address that? Yeah, it is. So, for example, for tax purposes, um, the way that um, agricultural land is defined is quite tightly drawn. Um, but also for tenancy law purposes, same thing. And these are issues that with the rock review covered and ministers are looking at them as part of their consideration of those recommendations. And we do, we do, I think it would be reasonable to say we, we do recognise that issue. There are considerations on either side because... Exactly as the questioner has said, you don't. You've got to consider what do you want this land to be used for primarily. If you want it to continue to be primarily used for agriculture, but you want to allow agri-environment schemes to be used as well, and make sure that that's not cast out. That's one thing. But I think if you draw the net too wide, then you are introducing the sort of risk that we did, that the questioner talked about in the last question. So that's the sort of consideration that you've got to do. Like, are we solving one problem and creating another? Or are we actually like, let's make sure we can see all the consequences of what we do before we take any action on this. I think it would be fair to say it's the sort of thing that we're thinking about as well as the question in principle. Yeah. And 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 I guess that leads on as well to the, the rules of good husbandry around what, what we as tenants are required to do, because, again, yeah. you could argue that some of the environmental stuff doesn't look like very good, good husbandry sometimes, certainly under the existing definitions. So, um, OK, I, as I say, I'm really conscious of time. We've we've overrun as usual. And uh, I'm always a bit conscious that I think these kind of online Zoom things have a, a, a slightly time limited um in terms of concentration span um but i guess there's a few things just to just to sort of summarize firstly janet you may have you may have convinced somebody to have another look i don't know if you've seen in the chat but somebody somebody's picked up on the fact there's no there's no penalties on sfi and has committed to have another look so uh, Excellent. let me know that's, what you think when you have a look yeah. <laughs> so that's that's a positive which is great um yeah. and 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 just on that i must i must say having been encouraged by my agronomist to do SFI and realising I should have done given what I've, what I know about it ages ago. Spent about three months dithering about how I was going to not do it and eventually got round to it. I think it took us about 25 minutes from start to finish. Um, discovered we could get considerably more better return out of it than I anticipated. Um, so it, it is it is definitely worth a look, I think. Although I will caveat that, that there are uh, quite a number still of farming systems who you know it is much less open towards and we do yeah. need a lot more of those options coming forward yeah. as, as soon as we can yeah so i was on um, that i would just encourage everyone sorry. to look now because lots of farmers have said that to us i visited a farmer he said he went into his office with a heavy heart thinking oh god i'll be gone all day doing this and he came out 20 minutes later saying where's the catch and so it is very yeah. straightforward but you're right at the moment we're not it's not a very broad offer but if you go in now you'll be able to add more land and more standards as they're added in so you don't need to wait till the, the more stuff comes you can go in now get started and then when we introduce the new scope next year then you'll be able to add that in yeah um no that, that's good and i do, would definitely encourage people to, to to go and have a look um the, the other thing just to summarize quickly and and if we can ask you janet just to ask answer some of these questions and and lynette also they want to pick up some of the ones that have been in the chat and the ones that were sent in that we haven't answered yeah that would be good but there is a there is also a bit of a theme around payment rates um, which again, I think we're picking up across the industry, particularly with capital items. I know that's something that you're looking at, but yeah. I suspect going forward, that's going to be really important, particularly with with CS. So um, yeah, we, we know yeah, we're on we're on it with that one. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, we can't stop ourselves, but but throw more things. Sorry, for you I'll to shut up. But for you to look <laughs> at and get right, but but yeah. Um, 
So anyway, first of all, thank you uh, very much for all of uh, you that have spent the time to, to listen in. I hope you found it useful. Um, and a big thank you again to, to Barclays for sponsoring these, these events. Uh, we will be back in 2023. And perhaps, Janet, we could ask you to join us again in uh, early 2023, yes. once the ministers have uh, uh, allowed you and to, to tick off and announce more formally what, what's happening. Yeah. Um, so January the 5th, 6th, does that sound January the 5th or 6th? Does that sound good for that? I wish the dates were under my control, Mark. My life would be a lot easier if they were, but they're not, sadly. So I don't know the exact date, but very happy to come back and, and, and yeah. I'm no, always that would happy be, to engage on no, this. That would, that would be great because I do think these are, are very useful. Um, yeah, so we, we are back after, after Christmas. Um, the next one is about slurry storage. Uh, there's a scheme being announced, launched, I think, uh, a couple of weeks ago, maybe. Uh, so we're going to uh, cover that uh, on the 11th of January, uh, similar time, seven o'clock. So we'll uh, hopefully look forward to uh, some of you joining us for that. Um, a big thank you once again to Janet for, for joining us. As I say, we, we do really welcome this engagement. It's good to hear. Uh, I think you've picked up the key messages that we've got. Um, a thank you as ever to Lynette for, for her contributions this evening as well. It's really good always to hear from Lynette and, and I know she does a fantastic job in pushing our issues uh, right across the board uh, wherever, wherever anybody will listen to her um, I don't don't take that badly Lynette because you do a great job um, so that's that's really good to see uh, a big thank you also to Julia once again for organizing uh, the technical side of this event uh, these would not happen without Julia I can assure you and uh, Interestingly, I was at a meeting this morning where we'd had a webinar thing uh, for a particular thing I'm involved with, and it was a bit of a shambles, I have to say, just because the technical side of it wasn't good. Um, and it is really good. J Julia does a fantastic job of that. So uh, thanks, thanks, Julia, for that. Um, and I guess it's just all to say, I hope everybody has a very good and relaxing Christmas. Uh, weather seems to have turned to more Christmassy weather today, certainly up here. Uh, so hope you all have a good Christmas and a happy new year uh, and a, a prosperous 2023. So thanks very much for joining. Mm -hmm.